Good morning. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Backbase webinar. Today's topic is the customer OS, a new claim uh, from Backbase. So, very much welcome to all of you for uh, attending. Um, maybe before we go into where the actual webinar, maybe a few logistic uh, remarks. Uh, copies of the slides presented today will be shared uh, afterwards, most likely tomorrow. Also, a recording of the webinar will be shared with you as well in the same email. So if you'd like to share this with colleagues uh, or other people, you can do so. If you have like questions, you can use, of course, uh, Twitter, or you can use the uh, question uh, panel. The control panel. So if you look at the control panel, uh, on the right, typically, there is one of the items is called questions. Down these questions throughout the webinar, and then in the last 10 minutes, we'll go there, and uh, we will start to address in the audience. Okay, let's uh, let's start. I'm here together with uh, with Tim and uh, myself. Uh, my name is. Jauk and Tim is um, my name is Tim. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Good to have you here, Tim. Let's uh, let's go. Yeah. Um, so the the key key uh, thing before we go into this customer OS story, maybe we can analyze uh, and we kind of go like a, a ten thousand feet perspective and quickly look at the world and a few key trends. So maybe the first key trend is that big platform players like Google, like Apple, like Facebook, like Amazon, they really start have a business model that is 100% digital. They have very powerful digital capabilities running in clouds all around the world. And they basically enable and simplify our life. And the success of these companies is quite remarkable. Because if we go to the next slide, uh, we see this. Uh, this is a picture of the, the most valuable companies in the world. And you see uh, the, the valuation in two. Intel, 2006, 2011, and now more recently in 2016, and you basically see they basically dominate with their own platforms and their own operating systems. They basically dominate the top five. And it's not only the Americans. It's also uh, this is happening in, in Japan. It's happening in China. It's happening in uh, South America. It's happening around very close just after the GAFA uh, big tech players from the US we also see the same thing with 10 so it's quite uh, quite interesting so apparently companies that have created digital platforms for information retrieval like Google or e-commerce 100% digital e-commerce overnight delivery like Amazon like Alibaba or companies that in own for Tencent, those companies basically control our digital lives. They started with this vision 15 years ago, but now today they basically dominate everything, every aspect of our life. And that's what we would like to discuss today. If we talk about what are these digital platforms doing, they are basically rating a digital cloud-based customer operating system. 100% digital, dominating their interactions with their customers, and basically giving them network effects to completely rule their space. Really predicted by uh, Mark Andreessen, the uh, the founder of Netscape, where a couple of years ago he said, "Software is eating the world," or digital customer OS platforms basically dominate uh, the world. So today's question is actually. to banking and how does that translate to the fact that banks actually need to accelerate their digital transformation to build a customer operating system to basically stay relevant in, in an economy that is now completely dominated. To analyze a little bit, if we look at these kind of big tech guys, what, what are the rules, what are the models they operate? 
you can elaborate a little bit on, I think what they do well, what they do extremely well, they do a 10 times better job. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Yeah. It's a, a typical social journey, um, where basically Carol wants to organize a party and invite 200 friends. Well, in the old world, all your friends, uh, you need to basically pick up the phone and, uh, and engage in conversations where right now, with minutes, I think even faster than 30 minutes, that's actually on the slide. So what you see there is it's really a job to be done that's simple. work effects and by the fact that this digital platform has these capabilities. So it's a simple example. It seems trivial, but already this is very impactful. Well, this is more like in a streaming video. Suppose that you're interested, like this Ben guy, in finding a very specific Hong Kong movie called a movie in a classic world without a digital operating system. This would take days, if not a full week. You have to go to physical title in place and you can only probably do this with a you know a niche type of uh, delivery model now with Amazon so these are examples you see the same with transportation with uber or grab taxi and APAC these platforms make it so X confusing frictionful they now make it one push and things are getting done so I think that's the first and they make it 10 times better. Overnight delivery, instant video retrieval, instant streaming, any the problem of the end customer and you nail that problem and you do it 10 times better. The next uh, key digital platforms that you can completely personalize the customer experience. From the moment, Within two minutes after opening that device and activating it, it is already personalized. We start to upload it with our own unique applications. We completely tailor these devices to our own unique needs. So that type of capability we all do with our iPhone or with our Android phone is happening at scale. Everything we see in our social feedback or social news feed is tailored to our previous behavior our previous behavior. Everything is based about tracking your behavior, understanding your behavior, understanding your preference, tailoring the experience. We see this happening at scale with Amazon, with Facebook, with Google, with Apple, with Android. That this, this trend will impact banking as well. How do we kind of move from mass production as well. And the interesting part is that I guess this type of mass individualization or with at the zero marginal cost level. So we're in a physical world, this is extremely expensive to accomplish. With a digital platform or with a customer operating system, it's totally possible and you can do it at zero marginal. Um, mass individualization and personalization at scale. Another one, maybe Tim, you want to elaborate on this one? Yeah, sure. So the, the second one is really about uh, tapping access, access capacity. Um, and what you find there is that if you would compare, for instance, the hotel business, really competitive compared to Hilton. So what you find there is that if you look at the number of rooms that those companies actually although it's a relatively new player in the space, has basically access to 1.4 million rooms, which is the capacity. To the right, you see that Hilton owns 700,000 rooms, where Airbnb obviously is tapping into, uh, let's say, the network in their homes. Then if you go to the second part, it says room openings per year. So with Hilton, that's around 25,000 new rooms a year which are serious investments, call it brick and mortar, where to the left you see that Airbnb is around 350,000 new rooms per year. So what you see there is that they can even accelerate by this model where they don't own any of the assets, they don't have any of that on their balance sheets, um, and still even uh, more impactful on the lower part of the slide, 
And that's really where this whole zero marginal cost uh, play kicks in, where with Hilton, this will always be at the level of, let's say, $200,000 per room. So if you look at that business model and how it scales, at scales is extremely powerful. And that's effectively what, uh, what all of this platform play is about. They don't physically own these assets. Correct. They basically just kind of make them available and they basically broker. And as part of the brokering pro process, which they do at scale, they can make their margin. Yeah, it's now yeah. where you come out. Yeah. Okay, so let's kind of analyze that, how that would translate into financial services. How can you broker stuff more efficiently? All right. Book, uh, what we see with big tech is that they basically can roll out at a very low cost because everything is digital. multi-country, multilingual approach without basically having to open physical branches or physical operations. A lending club or pan-European banks or North American digital neo banks, you can really scale quickly because it's just a key market segment you want to focus on. You create a different shade of compelling offering and you from there, once it's proven, Facebook was scaling globally, and they basically create one formula, they optimize that formula, and then they basically duplicate that. And because it's digital, the additional extra cost of duplication is extremely low compared to a classic brick and mortar type of uh, expansion model. And then finally, um, it, it's I guess it's all about data, right? If you if you look at kind of yeah. The whole AI trend. Yeah, once you have uh, once you have let's say that type of play, you have a platform ecosystem that you're uh, you're building out and that you're leveraging for your uh, for your touch points as well as your business model. Uh, from there onwards, you can potentially make it super smart, uh, and that's a combination of everything that we see in the space of artificial intelligence, um, think deep learning, all those types of newer uh, topics and capabilities where applied, they become extremely powerful. Uh, think about Siri, think about Google Home, think about uh, the Amazon uh, Echo that you see here on the, on the screen. Um, in reality, these are all very simple devices. And if you look at the electrical engineering, it's, it's pretty much not very interesting. Uh, but the interesting part here is that because these platforms have all of the data of the customers, categories, if you will, these devices are extremely powerful. So imagine one of these devices being in your home. You talk to these devices, acquire products for you, they advise you in your daily life, effectively making it super smart and very easy to use in forms and used. So this is also a trend that we see the platform businesses uh, basically pushing forward, meaning it really becomes super. So if we um, if we wrap this up. Basically, the formula here is that if we analyze these big tech guys and if we analyze these platform players, so where in the old world we had like the Windows operating system and Microsoft was dominating the desktop, now we do different model. These they basically dominate parts of our life and they are virtually available within a cloud and on any touch point, on any smartphone, on any desktop you have access to whatever they do. So we basically see Microsoft dominance position on the desktop with Windows now moving to cloud player, text processing and Excel sheet, but basically to run parts of our life, it's running in the cloud. That's what we mean with platform players are building a new OS. And what they basically do, if you look at the formula, they focus on the customer segment, they focus on the job to be done, and then they leverage the platform and the platform platform capabilities to basically deliver a 10 times better experience. All right, so that's the customer OS. And the, kind of the key question now is that if this is happening in all sorts of aspects of our life, what is, does it mean for financial services? So I think what, what, what is important if we is that they did a lot of acquisitions in the last 10 years to basically build their customer OS, to, to kind of have all the critical capabilities in their cloud-based platform to enable everything they do to dominate in their business model. And I think a, more, a little bit more either you know, interesting or, or they are moving beyond their original core business. So here, for instance, you basically see they're now your life. 
from health to entertainment to consumption to payments, communication, etc. So, with Amazon now you can get small business loans, or you can get consumer loans, or with Amazon you can do payments. And the same with Apple. The same with Google. They're starting to dominate in 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 wallets. So, what does this mean for the financial services industry around the world? That these big tech players, they are raising the bar in many levels. They are raising the bar from a customer experience point of view. If it's so easy with one push to accomplish something with Amazon or with Uber or anyone else, why can I not have that kind of same, similar, easy feedback? So the raising of the bar is basically why the experience level, absolutely, but also getting stuff done without talking to someone without a branch, that's kind of one element. The second question that you could ask is that are these guys potentially becoming competitors? And I think we're all kind of fully aware of that most people yeah. here in the audience is that there is a possibility. And in, in certain parts of the world, it's a reality. Especially in Asia, you see Alipay start to dominate aspects like loans, lending, payments. So it, it's real and this can actually the rollout across uh, other parts of the world as well. Will it disappear the classic banking? I think that's very unlikely, but do we need to react within the banking industry to go full? Absolutely. So I think the key question here is that as a banking industry, um, how do we kind of uh, prevent kind of a codec moment? And I think what I would like to highlight, if you look into the history of code, the fact that there was digital, they actually owned digital cameras. They had an online photo sharing capability that is almost like Instagram avant la lettre. So Kodak did all the right things. They had a digital camera, they had photo sharing online, they had all the initiatives they were pushing and they were driving, didn't prevent them from basically becoming irrelevant. And that kind of an Technology is care, innovation lab, a digital innovation fund, fintech, but are we really changing the bank to stay relevant? Are we fundamentally rebuilding the way we run the business and really make it digital at the core? So I think the difference between business transformation, where digital is truly at the core, and, and the more bold decision. So let's uh, let's explore uh, how we can move forward and what it kind of means uh, for for the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the um, at the current statement that's on the slide, it says the battle is for the customer interface. Um, this is something, of course, that Backbase is often in the market. Basically, the belief is in the basics that the customer experience is the part that you would need to lift and have an impact on. That's something we'll discuss in a second. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to be customer first as an industry. Uh, uh, meaning once we start thinking about anything we do from a digital transformation perspective, let's start with the customer first and that results in the customer in really nails that part of the, uh, let's say, experience in their respective markets, they will get the market share. And this is something that we've literally seen happening in, uh, in different regions. So basically what the slide says, time to master the interface layer. In my book, it means time to really be customer first and optimize our journey needs to be done um, that we want to want to tackle. Yeah, what I also like here is kind of these little subsets, like smartphones are our primary access point to everything. <laughs> that is true. Right, yeah. that's true. That's yeah. even one, a little bit more, more precise. What it also says, life, we live in a time of so the smartphones are there, the cloud capacity is there, the network connectivity is there. The only thing that's really valuable is time. Do I want to spend five days on opening accounts? No. no Do I not. expect this to happen in a couple of minutes? Yes. So the smartphone is smartphone and time. It's almost like those two ingredients. Well, well those two ingredients, that's what, uh, what the big players are doing properly. They do it properly, 10 yeah. times better. Yeah. And how do we translate this into banking? 
next slide. And this is super simple, but also super true. Customers don't care if companies don't care. Any digital transformation program in banking or in any other industry that it starts with a true commitment to do a tech product led. It's not bank led, it's not process led. It's all about how can we. That's how the original idea behind Uber. It was the frustration. How, how difficult is it to get a taxi, right? Let's solve it. That was the problem with Google. It is so hard to find information on the internet. Let's do it 10 times better. That's why it became the dominant force. They did it 10 times better. So I think at the, at the, at the, at the foundation of every digital transformation program, it's not a technology from the bank, the executives, and the execution team to kind of really do a better job for for the end customer. Okay, so if that is clear, we can actually maybe a few, uh, look at a few examples. Here's the Uber one I, uh, I already highlighted, but basically, regardless of the more recent controversy about kind of some of the Uber's uh, culture aspect, if we go back to their original idea, they are basically with this app, the original idea, and still valid today, they are solving a lot of critical pain points. Yeah. A single app, a digital customer OS, that is brokering demand and supply, they do a very good job. It's also quite interestingly, they are leveraging a lot of common platform capabilities. They are leveraging Google Maps technology without owning it. They are enabling payments seamless and frictionless, Amazon with AWS. So it's kind of interesting. They are able to kind of create this huge platform business to enable transportation around the world. They're creating a very valuable company from a market cap point of view by just in a simple app powered by a very powerful platform in the, in the, in the, in the cloud. And by doing so, they are, are also leveraging third party technologies that are basically commodity and everybody can take them and use them so let's let's try to take this as almost like the key ingredients or the key check of uh, digital transformation in banking anything you'd like to add uh, nope all right <laughs> cool so here you see the picture you basically have the app that gets the job done fast fix, frictionless and easy delightful beautiful simple customer OS to basically orchestrate everything and then behind the scenes the customer OS will be connected to either legacy system like can integrate and, and consume multiple fintech capabilities it can integrate open APIs but basically it's the seamless experience for the end user and it connects and leverages platform capabilities either in legacy world as well as it to be orchestrated uh, in, a, in a simple and easy way. So this is kind of moving is basically identical. How do we create seamless apps? How do we have a customer OS in the middle to broker in the APR world, bringing it all together? And that's kind of maybe the, the, the topic for the remaining part of this webinar in this in this blue box what's going on there what are the key ingredients that are basically essential and so the first impact item is basically within the customer os you have an ambitious situation a lot of channels and a lot of silo type of scenarios how do we move that in to only channel Effectively, any type of uh, bank where you would talk to, you will find that they have a uh, a legacy, either by design over the past years, because new channels were introduced and hence new silos were introduced. Could also their ecosystem. Yeah. Long story short, given that you have these silos, you are limited by them in a way. However, moving forward. And this is the uh, the next part of the slide. You want to move to an omni-channel world. Now, how do you do this? This is effectively where um, the backbase platform with Kickin 
you would effectively have one digital platform, one customer OS, if you will, that lives on top of all of these existing systems. Now, for that, you need omnichannel fabric. So that's effectively the technical capabilities to in decouple from uh, whatever you have existing in your uh, in your legacy backends. Once you have that connectivity available, from there onwards, you can start driving any type of channel. So on top of the, uh, let's say the right top part of the slide, you see internet, mobile, and branch. And those are just examples of channels that you can digitally support. So imagine a customer journey where I, as a customer, onboard on uh, my desktop environment. I do a passport upload using my uh, iPhone, for instance. And from there onwards, an employee in the call center will actually validate my passport, confirm it, or even give me a quick conversation, a quick call to welcome me as a new customer. Those types of journeys across all of those different channels would be using the same end-to-end -end capabilities throughout the platform. And that's really allowing you you can only do when you have this omnichannel fabric in place. Okay, I'll, I'll buy into it, Tim, but it also sounds a little bit like boiling an ocean. It's like a, an order of magnitude. Like, how do, you, how do you slice and dice this big elephant? Yeah, um, certainly. Uh, so what you'll find there is that you will point uh, that has business value that directly surfaces a need with uh, with the actual customers and what you find there is that uh, retail banking um, which you could launch let's say within six months from there onwards with that appetite you start moving into other channels other ambitions that you might have within the bank um, where at the same time you really start moving into this new agile way of working okay so you have to take a specific slide uh, an app. Yep. So you take more like an app perspective, like a little bit more horizontal. You create something uh, actually kind of create an omni-channel journey where they do things in parallel, like they do just like an onboarding process, and they do it horizontal type of way of of, of uh, skinning the cat. Yeah. You see both flavors. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about customer journeys. So if you hear you can deliver. Yeah. All right, cool. So this is the first point. The the second uh, key point is uh, over here. How do we move from monoliths into a modular architecture? Yeah, what you see there is um, obviously if we if we talk about the previous slide, then uh, you have silos, you have monoliths. It's not it's not nicely uh, let's say sanitized and made available uh, to your front end tiers. Um, but in this case, if we look at the left. Part, this is the problem that you're typically say, uh, facing. There's a monolith, there's multiple monoliths. How do we make them, uh, let's say, more achieve? How do we use them in a way that the digital ambition is achievable? Yeah. So if you move one part to the right, you see, sure, let's decouple those layers. I think that's that's the first step. Uh, but that's not, let's say, the end. And uh, Lego style building block architecture. And what you see there, and this is exactly what the architecture of the backbase platform is all about, effectively the customer operator system is that across all the different layers, across all the different capabilities, be it in the front end or the back end, there's smaller standalone components that are truly ambition against. Um, having said that, delivering your ambition, it also means that from a back-based perspective, we have accelerators that are ready to go for you, that you could pick up in end-to-end -end value streams, end-to-end -end capabilities, that you can even have specific feature squads to deliver with and own that uh, own that part of the uh, right. Basically, at the left, you cannot even achieve this type of goal. If you move to the right, that's what you need to actually have an approach towards your digital ambitions. You mentioned the word agile, right? So once you have these building blocks, how do you Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you look at the, uh, let's say, the, the Rubik's Cube over here or the Lego block, so Mm -hmm. um, all of these can be considered as standalone capabilities, yeah. and they're truly separated out. They're truly decoupled. Uh, they're autonomous building blocks, if you will. Um, implies that one agile team can own an end-to-end -end capability. So that's important. They own end-to-end. -end. So that's the UI components into a backend. System. Correct. Correct. All right. So you can kind of basically organize it around capabilities. Correct. Yeah. And then these agile and kind of work together with end customers to kind of improve uh, yeah. their functionality. Yeah. And they're truly autonomous in that sense. 
and not only capability like that, I can, I can reuse it, I guess, in, in different, I can reuse it in mobile, I can reuse it in my call center, I can reuse my channel fabric to, uh, to actually have that reuse across the board. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's uh, maybe go to the third thing. That's all about the, the classic world, I would say, can be better described as more like a closed environment, uh, which is very you can elaborate a bit. Yeah, so from how do you move from that closed banking environment to that open banking environment? That's basically the two from your silos towards a truly omni-channel play. And then from there onwards, you want to move towards a more agile and open uh, platform. Once you have those ingredients in place, you effectively move into the open banking space. Um, what it allows you to do, it allows you to introduce any type of third-party APIs, any type of third-party capability, let's say direction of other providers and other players. Um, and this is effectively what, uh, what will allow you to go really fast and also and becoming that open and becoming that agile will really allow you to drive, let's say, smaller experiments, um, which is effective. So I think open is, is, is about APIs, but then with APIs, you have, you have two models. Uh, you can either consume and expose APIs. Yeah. So from an impact on the banking strategy, which one do you like most? I think the consumption of APIs is super powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're effectively, you are owning the mashup, you are owning the gloss. Uh, and that bringing that back to uh, earlier statements. Let's kind of go back who owns that mashup and owning that experience in the app. You can do it partly with your own stuff in the back end, but you can also partly do this by consuming yes. third party capabilities. Yeah. And the exposing part is, it's not a differentiating part, right? Uh, it is great to uh, to go more into an ecosystem play and make your capabilities available to, uh, let's say, the developer community, that's definitely interesting. Um, but from that, that's more of a commodity play as well, because everyone can open up APIs, and yeah. it's relatively easy in that sense. What is differentiating, and that's the strategy we typically uh, advise our customers to go for, yeah. is to make a composite and to make a business model with combinations of equals you want to go for, and for that, you need the ingredients that we've just discussed. Yeah. OK, so to, for, to be clear, backbase, of course, is open, and it provides to work with from a business impact, you see more impact than actually consuming stuff. Correct. Yeah, yeah. clear. Okay. Number four is all about this hyper uh, mass customization or hyper personalization, right? Production and basically in, in the banking context, we're able to kind of give our customer kind of a one size fits all type of experience with the digital as we're kind of moving into an era of, uh, of smart personalization. What's your vision on this? Yeah, what you, um, it's actually a very interesting topic because what you find there is that uh, there's a lot of buzz around AI, deep learning, you name it, and there's a lot of new topics there that are very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, if you look at it's all, right? That's the, that's the yeah. starting point. Yeah. If you move to the right, and again, with all the other slides that we, uh, that we used as well today, From the customer as in this case. And from that onwards, you're in a totally different space, meaning you truly understand the customer, you own a different already in a rules-based setting, you can make your bank 10 times smarter because that's the topic we uh, we were talking about thus far. Yeah. Yeah. Any other type of technology or uh, let's say smart engine, you could leverage and introduce to your implementation, meaning AI or whatever type of engine that is out there. And again, those are typically platform capabilities that you either consume from the Googles, the Amazons, and so forth. If you then think about that, what are the cards that we can uh, draw from? The start is actually relatively simple still, because you understand the Already by setting up a smart banking uh, implementation using rules, personalization, and targeting, you're 80% 80, 80 already there. So that's interesting. If I, link, if I think smart banking, I really think like PhD guys and I think like uh, super scientist people to make all these magic uh, happening. But, but, but there's something much more simple, like like low-hanging fruit, like simple yep. rule-based. What this 
people can already dramatically improve the customer experience. Exactly, especially if you move from the left of the slide to the right, that's a massive improvement. Yeah. Um, and from there onwards, what you will find is that at the end of the day, especially if you move into uh, into the AI uh, play, mm -hmm. you'll find that you will still need data scientists, right? There's no magic. And that's definitely a topic that uh, also highly interests DACBase, and you will find that by putting that baseline in, you'll also be able to stronger validate what do we actually need to do on the other topics there. Yeah, clear. All right, cool. So let's kind of summarize this. The four value drivers of the customer OS. And basically what you see any touch points, any end user. Employees, customers, partners, affiliates, one platform in any device sector. Second, Agility. How do we move from monoliths into modular building blocks and innovate on a sprint by sprint basis with real time delivery to the market? Adding APIs, but also more importantly, about consuming APIs and basically creating a mashup. A mashup that can go far beyond what you do with your core banking system and enables you to kind of almost experiment with new classic banking capabilities, maybe fintech capabilities, and maybe even non-banking related capabilities, bringing them all together. In How do we make it smart, right? Yep. I think just a simple, plain, vanilla, stupid app with transaction of it's, it's not going to cut it probably in the next five years. We need to apply logic. Basically, rules or really transform the customer experience into a more relevant, more pragmatic, more almost like white glove tree. Oh, cool. correct. All right. So with this, uh, you basically see the, the, the core summary. And we basically try to transform really doing business transformation. And business transformation means how do we make digital at the core? And how do we avoid just scratching digital on the service, but really incorporating digital in the core? With the customer OS, you've got those value drivers. How do we go to Omni? How do we go to Agile? How do we go? How does the customer OS for financial services or for banking kind of enable us uh, to do that? With the end goal, of course, net net to create a superior customer value, 10 times better. So I think this is kind of the Q&A, but the vision here is that a customer OS is what Amazon is doing for e-commerce, we need something for banking that does that. It creates seamless customer journeys, it's frictionless, it's fast, it's all type of innovation speed uh, where individual end-to-end -end capabilities can be developed, expand, if they don't succeed, you can go to the next. All right, so maybe a little bit metaphor, uh, how do we see Yes, I think the, the customer OS and kind of the back-based vision is basically very similar to kind of the Apple model with the iPhone, which was introduced 10 years ago. So here you see the iPhone, which is, then you see the baseline solutions created by Apple, like the browser, Safari, mail, music, messaging, etc. And then on top of that, opening up, enabling third-party developers to create whatever utility is out there, basically creating added value within the customer OS, within the Apple business model. And we know how impactful it has been. And we've seen the huge impact of Apple in the translated into banking. Here you see your basic financial institution with all its core systems. to really, just like iOS and the App Store, to really help you to kind of create this new digital-only business model. On top of that, basic solutions provided by Backbase, the 101 capabilities that you require for your minimum viable product in retail banking, in business 
on top of that, an open architecture that basically enables you and any any other developer out there to come. Hopefully, a kind of a useful metaphor on how this kind of customer OS vision can help you to kind of really make digital operation and at the core of of the financial services uh, business model. OS, just to kind of position it, and then we go to the QA. Just to position it correctly, it sits on top of your core systems. banking system, it will leverage your CRM infrastructure, etc. But what it does, it enables you to innovate at a digital two-speed architecture. It's a little bit more difficult to innovate fast on these core systems. It's basically more don't drop system, which is digital first. You can innovate faster. You can do it on any device for any user. the customer experience. I think most of you that are familiar with Backbase will recognize this picture, but it kind of puts it in perspective. But also, where does it sit? Then, if we kind of analyze it, and maybe, uh, Tim, you can elaborate a little bit on it. Once we go into touch on the five core layers, uh, what's in there? Sure. So, um, as Jacques just alluded to, you basically see it on, uh, let's say, on a customer perspective on the top of the slide you see tailored advice real-time support and so forth that's really the digital channels that you can uh, can understand yep. but if we do we envision it need to be in place uh, to actually drive this type of vision so first of all there's a user experience management layer and this is all the experiences on any type of device any type of channel for any type of user also how do we manage these experiences the, the control of the digital channel. So is this is stuff like on the glass, right? This is how do we make sure that it kind of properly runs on a smart phone. Right, put everything right. together, yeah. But also content management, uh, personalization, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. So everything you would expect from a content management system and even way more because all of the other capabilities that bleed into it, like targeting, like personalization and so forth, yeah. yeah. From there onwards, you find that the lower we go in the stack, the more business logic is needed to actually uh, do the proper orchestration of the journeys. Um, and there you see a very important component which we've been heavily investing in, which is a dis the digital banking capability. Introducing a lot of, let's say, yeah, digital banking. <laughs> it is what it is, right? It's on the glass. Uh, we start investing drive these journeys, even though the core might not support them or they might be outside of the core context and you don't want to deliver them. drive a digital journey across all of these different channels, whether that's to stage, persist, enrich, categorize, or do anything in terms of doing that layer. And that's also, let's say, an end-to-end -end capability which we ship with the product. And that's maybe just to yeah, kind of sure. tip in. I mean, this digital banking layer, I think it's, 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 you kind of give a kind of a technical description, which is, is, is accurate and very accurate. As, as an example, I guess, right, it is also quite often these digital banking capabilities complement for the core. Mm -hmm. As an example, a lot of cores are batch, where the customer wants to do real-time payments. So the, the payment capability in the D, everything is 24-7. So even if the core is offline or batch, it's still available for the end customer. Uh, and to the core, if, they, if it provides real-time search on the transaction history and it can do it in milliseconds, great. If not, basically the transaction capability over here in the customer OS, and then we can offer Google type search instant. Most like to complement the stuff that you cannot do with the core. Correct. And the stuff that you really need to kind of orchestrate cross device, cross cross-channel type of customer journeys. Yeah. Fair enough? Yeah, fair yeah. enough, yeah, cool. exactly. Okay. All right, so moving forward, um, advanced entitlements, and what you find there is that user management, uh, strong authentication, multi-factor authentication from different types of topics, you need that as fabric in these layers to really drive the customer OS vision. You look at advanced entitlements, 
elements, that's really where things can get extremely complex. Um, and that's also the interesting part of, uh, of the back-based offering because this is a component that, we, uh, that we've been strongly investing in. And what you find there is that at anything in a, in a business banking context or a wealth banking context where there's multiple stakeholders for approvals, rejections, having access to those flows, we can account for. That combined with identity and access management basically gives you a full-blown user management and entitlement solution which we feel is very relevant. So as an example, like a UK, as a retail customer, I can give certain entitlements to my kids, yep. as an example, sure. or to do and collaborate with me, yep. right? Of course, up to a very large corporate where you've got a gazillion business units, but can, can basically scale from giving consent and authorize people within your family up into your large you know, ecosystem. Right as a small business owner up into, let's say, a Procter & Gamble managing a gazillion accounts. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. correct. Yeah. All right. Um, if you then move forward, you see process digitalization and forms, or dynamic case management, if you will. And what you find there is that many of the journeys that, uh, that we typically look at from a banking perspective are, um, they're not one-off journeys on one screen, right? They're multiple steps. Um, they're typically they could be quite complex, for instance, a mortgage uh, origination flow. Um, there's many underlying uh, integrations that you would leverage or third-party APIs that you use for KYC or anti-money laundering. There's quite some complexity. And to make it reusable, you want to make it omni-channel, uh, and you want to hold state across the different channels. And that's exactly why this layer... So, Tim, I guess this is the part where I would say, let's go for uh, onboarding, origination, self server straight through processing, yep. going paperless, yep. get stuff done, everything digital, no call center, no branch, everything digital. Again, you see the stakeholders like a typical customer journey across devices, but also, and that's also where it's extremely powerful on the employee-facing side. Yeah. Components, the same patterns are being used for whichever stakeholder, which also optimizes, again, your right. At least, uh, basically, cloud to allow you to run the full customer operating system um, in the cloud, uh, and that driving all of these journeys uh, is something that is paramount. I guess cloud is, of course, uh, quite interesting for people that this level. I guess this is also about the capability that you can actually release every day or every week, right? Yeah, yeah. So, where I know a lot of banks, we can. Only have a release window every quarter, like maybe four times a year. It's like a big thing. And if you yeah. if you miss the time slot, you basically have to wait another uh, three months. Yep. So with, with this cloud, with this cloud fabric, you basically can go much more like every week. Correct. It's basically all the way agile, allowing yeah. you. To yeah, cool. Yeah. Super cool. All right. Cool. So maybe to wrap up, uh, the, the, and then we go to the QA. I mean, what we just described. Technical layers of the uh, customer OS or kind of this omnichannel channel digital banking platform. But what's quite interesting, Tim, is that we also created something like a model bank. And maybe you can elaborate also on that a little bit. Yeah, so right now we've been talking about layers and openness and so forth. Uh, but at the end of the day, we as Backbase, we ship an end to end product. Uh, that also means that for all the segments, retail banking, business banking, as well as wealth banking, um, we ship a model bank out of the box, which is effectively composite, located. Um, taking that as a baseline will be a massive acceleration in uh, in going to market. So, utilizing this back base uh, platform and kind of your model bank stuff, does it mean like I start a project and I can take this kind of model bank? And yes, most definitely. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, um, in in one way, it's an accelerator. You pick it up, you move from there. Uh, um, in a way you yeah, but that's that's the problem because on the other hand, I could also argue that everybody starts to look the same, right? Uh, correct. Correct. So that's yeah. there, but still with the fabric of the platform. There you go. You combine best of both worlds. Yeah, I think, and maybe this is is that here you see kind of a diagram about kind of the strategy for your digital transformation. On one end, you have these packaged internet banking solutions. 
funnel of out-of-the-box capabilities. You can actually activate them quite quickly, time to market quite okay, but extremely difficult to customize, close to impossible. So nice in feature set, nice in time to market, but horrible from a flexibility point of view, horrible from a differentiation point of view. So not very ideal to basically control your digital future. Yeah, because basically you're, you're boxed in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the other side. We can go all the way, right? Mm -hmm. But prerequisite, you need 3,000 developers. That's doable. Next, you need to make them productive, slightly more complex. And then they basically have to create all the customer OS fabric themselves. And then on top of that, basically create the customer value, yeah. right? So think over here, if custom code, it is, it is great in flexibility because you can basically create everything, but it's hard in cost in people and process complexity. We try to really combine those best of worlds. I think here with the model bank, you get all the stuff out of the box, so you can go live. So your baseline capabilities are there, and you go, but you can customize, and you can extend, and you can create your own logic. Right? Which is kind of a little bit more over here. Yep, correct. Okay, cool. All right, that's it uh, from a, an overall point of view. So maybe we actually can now go into the um, Q&A. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, there's already quite a few questions uh, in here, but if you go to the control panel, uh, there is this item called questions, and please feel free uh, to, um, to go in there and type in your question. We're going to share the video. That is probably from people that kind of uh, joined us a little bit later. Yes, we are going to share the recording, and we are going to share uh, the PowerPoint. All of you will receive an email, most likely tomorrow, uh, and then with there, you can actually uh, use and view and uh, Okay, let's go into the uh, the other questions. Um, the first, what are the architectural and uh, prerequisites uh, for this? Art. That's to that question, the, um, the the prerequisites are always different, right? The uh, the actual starting point is where are you? today, what tracks that are running to to get through uh, a digital transformation properly. Um, so there's, there's no, and we're basically put on hold or we have to wait because there's other things that need to be in place first. Um, and I'm saying that because it's, it's a very important on our platform. Um, our platform lives on top of whatever, on top of everything that you already have. mature that's great that's actually, that's actually a plus point we can go faster if that's not the case we deal with whatever is available and for that we're fully open fully agnostic to uh, to consume whatever is there um, so from that perspective the prerequisite would mostly be on how do you organize yourself side do you have the right buy-in do you have the right theme within the bank to actually make this transition happen yeah i think that's more of an important uh, topic to address i guess if you look at the skill sets this the skill sets are just mainstream right iPhone, an Android developer, a, a Java developer, uh, but also a Microsoft or any other. So basically, I think um, the normal mainstream development skills are, I guess, a prerequisite. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So in that sense, it, it's open technology. It's completely yeah. open technology, right? Yeah. yeah. Which are the APIs that are already ready included in the Backbase uh, platform? This is a question from Pablo. Yeah. If you look at the let's say APIs coming from the customer OS, it's effectively all the APIs that we currently have available in our product, and we're APIs on a two-weekly heartbeat uh, to be specific. If you want to understand the API documentation, there's uh, the, the my backbase environment. That's a tip for everyone. If you want to look at the documentation of the product, go to mydobackbase.com. You can register there, um, and basically you can get insight into everything that we have on offer. At the same time, you can look at our APIs. Also, any APIs that you already have available, we can easily map against those. So it's not necessarily the case that they have to align fully. You need to do work on your end. We effectively generate against yours and introduce those into our platform. Yeah. Yeah. Another question from Pablo. We do 
a little bit more quickly because we've got a lot of questions we need to run through. Digital banking capabilities. What are the off-the-box shelf-ready capabilities? I think it's payment, it's accounts, it's transactions, uh, entitlements. There's a whole bunch. But basically, I would say all the one-on-one -on -one capabilities you would expect in a digital banking um yeah there's another one here um the skill set third it's kind of the, the normal dev and the ops requirements completely open technologies uh basically we just go with an academy we upskill the people with their ios and an android and html and java skill sets to basically understand the mechanics of the backbase framework we share the cookbooks uh but completely open. I think also maybe Tim you can briefly uh, make a quick remark about the software development life cycle. How cycle wise you'll find and that's I think also very standard in the market. Um, it's really about smaller components that are cycle their own repositories and their own testing flows that they automatically go through um, and for that as well there's a reference blueprint from a backbase perspective that is optimal. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's again market standards. So if you work with these types of, uh, let's say, technologies that we illustrated thus far, uh, anything goes. And I know that's a little uh, a little more vague uh, than you probably are looking for, but as your solution architect, you'll probably understand how you want to design your SDLC, you can, but also we give you a reference that, uh, that we feel works best. Yeah, I think for all of you who are, really would like to go a little bit more deeper than uh, what we can do here today, please reach out to Backbase and we can organize uh, a more deep dive, a one or two hour deep dive, and we can really prepare the agenda with you and we will connect you with our with our specialist. Uh, uh, Tim, what is a typical implementation time for a medium-sized bank? Sure. Um, so, so what we typically, and the MVP is typically time box in six to nine months, let's say nine on the max, six on the, let's say, most optimal scenario. Open to deliver against that. So that's basically your your starting point again, um, and then it's really uh, about uh, getting ready for squad, right? Like yeah. ten people? Yeah, correct. Like a regular squad, you would go for. Yeah. So if I would have two squads, I can basically, for instance, online and uh, and a mobile. You could do parallel tracks. Multiple tracks. Yeah, multiple capabilities together. All right, cool. Um, what is Work effort, Harky. Uh, how do we integrate uh, the, uh, also? How do digital business capabilities such as entitlements provided by Backbase integrate with the legacy core uh, that does not provide this feature? Yeah, um, there's multiple answers. There's also a few questions I would typically go to. Of course, uh, you're leveraging our integration service capability uh, that's using enterprise integration patterns. Uh, that's typically, uh, let's say, a few sprints of baseline integration work uh, to get the baseline in there. If you then un would like to understand how entitlements bleeds into the picture, if entitlements engine will become the system of record, if you will, for the entitlements piece, and that cascades through the whole implementation. Um, as the starter for, for that the, the discussion, but happy to, uh, yeah. uh, to, to go into more detail. We can go offline into a deep dive. Another one here is from uh, Marek. Marek is asking, what if the bank to do everything with Backbase? Oh. So again, it depends a bit on uh, what are those requirements specifically, but what you will find are a few flavors. Uh, first of all, in the Backbase layer, you can also extend and build your own capabilities, be it on the front end or on the back end. You can decide to store more the system of record for your core banking data. So typically, that's a given that will be there, and from there onwards, it's usually, let's Backbase platform next to standard, uh, let's say banking logic. Um, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's a mapping exercise. Yeah. Question from uh, Alejandro is here in Mexico. Regulator rule demands that uh, the production data must be inside the country. Uh, does Backbase? Good question. So it's all about uh, due to reg regulation, we need to uh, host the solution and own. This is fully agnostic in terms of deployment methods. Uh, so whether you go classic on-prem on bare metal in your own premises, 
you will, uh, that's all fully supported. So the technology stack is uh, is supportive of both uh, models. Yeah, I think uh, to summarize, we do have customs, Alejandro, in Me Mexico, and we're familiar with this requirement. Uh, maybe you work with them, or maybe you're with another bank. Uh, but we can do on-premise in your own data center. We can go into private clouds. We can go into public clouds. And if you go into private or public cloud, depending on your 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 kind of regulators' uh, requirements, uh, you then work with a specific uh, jurisdiction. Yep. So that's simple. Um, good. Um, maybe you can this is a question from uh, Ignacio. Um, yeah, certainly yeah. there's a, there's quite a set uh, at this moment. But just, uh, just to mention a few, I think Backbase currently the platform is used by a little bit more than 100 uh, banks around the world. These banks are literally on every part of the world, so in every continent, from, from Australia, New Zealand, to Asia Pacific, to the Middle East, to Africa, to Europe, the UK, and then into North America and South America. Um, it ranges from very large large mega banks from uh, an HBC, a Citibank, uh, a Deutsche Bank, up to more local banks that are kind of really digital. Uh, we also have neo banks. So for instance, in Europe, we are utilized by uh, Kebanka, uh, a, a very uh, successful neo bank. We're utilized by Orange, one of the largest telcos here in Europe that using uh, the Backbase platform for Orange Bank. So it basically ranges from mega global banks into digital neo banks or banks in all parts of the world that have a very strong ambition to become a, a digital uh, digital leader. More and more questions. So we basically have to uh, see, uh, let's do a few more. Um, Eugene is asking here, is it also be on premise? Short answer? Yes. <laughs> so it can be on, on premise, or both. Another one. Um, oops, this is a long uh, sentence to summarize. Okay, another question. <laughs> question. Recommended approach to address the customer experience as well as a tool for the branch and the contact center. Contact center, or you know, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the sequence? Yeah. Um, I think the the uh, the most typical sequence that we see. Is is um, addressing customer needs, uh, meaning going mobile first with a small application or uh, going web first with, uh, with your first, uh, let's say, release. And from there, channels ramp lead channels. Um, we also do see it the other way around, but yeah. it really depends on where is your, let's say, going to apply. So basically, I think the, to, to, to echo uh, Tim, the sequence doesn't matter. Term, right? Right. So you follow your impact. We have customers that have a burning platform on the call center. We start there. I would say the vast majority of the projects we see start mobile first, customer facing, and then subsequently they start to evolve from mobile into online and then into employee facing. So that's a journey. But just again, uh, there's also quite a few that uh, basically start the other way around and uh, they start with uh, with uh, 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 how much redundancy is there with introducing an API platform? We are looking at both. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. So um, there's from uh, Chat. All right, Chat. Good question. Well done. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so uh, we are a consumer of typically an API platform. So whether it's a MuleSoft or any of the other solutions, those are usually. Either where we are a consumer of those APIs that you make available out of your back offices. And from there onwards, of course, there's going to be a lot of new APIs that we add to the mix, which are the backbase APIs. And those are basically powering the digital channels. Um, first and foremost, that's all the widgets and capabilities that backbase ships. Uh, but also in your ecosystem or even external, external consumers outside of the ecosystem. In order to do that, regardless, you will... Yeah, so, so no redundancy, it's actually a good uh, good combo. Yeah, Backbase doesn't want to become an API management layer, right? We were Correct. Backbase is available, and then typically that kind of connects to the API management framework. Yeah. Um, so especially, yeah, larger banks definitely use 
Um, do you have a strong notification or eventing framework? Can you describe that a little? This is a question from uh, Reinhardt. Yeah. There's, uh, there's capabilities in our digital banking layer that allow us to trigger alerts, that allow us to trigger notifications. If there's the net was, uh, was earlier referenced. Um, and indeed, what you find there is that the framework is in place to actually do all of these, let's say, based from underlying systems, anything happening within the backbase uh, platform, and then sending it out through uh, the different channels. Yeah, I've actually execute that smart banking strategy which you were describing yes, uh, earlier. Certainly. Yeah, okay. Any financial institutions? In yeah, short answer, Gene, that is uh, correct. Uh, we uh, announced already a year ago uh, our partnership with. Uh, supporting a, a larger part of the credit union and banking market in the Canadian uh, market. Um, question about pricing. Uh, we prefer to take that uh, offline and uh, maybe first kind of qualify what you need, and then with that we'll uh, we'll take it uh, a little bit uh, step further. Um, if you feel that you still have a burning question but we're not able to uh, to answer it right now, please feel free to, uh, to reach out. Out, uh, contact form or an email address and uh, feel free to shoot an email uh, to, to us or just shoot us another message on any part of the day and uh, we'll make sure you get connected uh, either to the right answer or to the right person. Uh, for your time and, uh, and a great questions, uh, great interaction here. Uh, I think we, we enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. yeah thanks. <laughs> cool. So thank, thank you. Bye-bye.